Of course, the, the next keynote speaker needs no introduction. You have his bio. It is the, can I now call the legendary Justin Lin? But what is not in his, what is not in his bio, of course, is how he got his start, which was when he was at the University of Chicago in 1986, and the National Committee asked him to be the translator for a financial delegation from China that included many who went on to become leaders in the economic field. It was our board member and head of the Ford Foundation, uh, Peter Geithner, who actually recommended him to us. And we said, but we need somebody who can explain America to this delegation. And Peter said, he can explain America. And the fact of the matter was, he did. And it was a spectacularly successful delegation and it showed the vision of uh, my predecessors who chose Justin to lead that, to be the translator for that delegation and obviously to start an incredibly productive now 32 year relationship with the committee. But please join me in welcoming Justin Lin. Thank you very much, Steve. It's always a pleasure to come back to the national community, uh, national committee, and to enhance our understanding between China and the U.S. And uh, certainly, the focus today is, is economic growth in China. And uh, as the previous panel mentioned, the slowing down in the Chinese economy. Is real. But the concern for us is not last year. The concern for us is this year and the coming years. And whether the Chinese economy is going to you know, decelerate further, what the Chinese economy can maintain reasonably high growth rate. Very much depends on what were the causes for the deceleration in the Chinese economy. And uh, whether those kind of factors is going to change or not. As well as whether China has the opportunity for further growth drivers and uh, the resources that can be, can be mobilized to tap into the potential. Regarding the causes of China's deceleration, certainly, you know, you have been advised it was because of some problem in the steel enterprise sectors, some inefficiency in the financial sectors, and a deficit in social you know, protection as well as aging, all those kind of problems. I agree. Those problems are there. But those problems are some kind of long term issue, has been there for, you know, 40 years. And I would say in the past, those kind of problems were more serious than now because China. It's on the process of reform, and uh, although there are still some problems, but actually the problem in those areas have been mitigated. People may also mention too, maybe it was because of trade war with the US. It may have some impact, but the data show China's trade in 2018 was quite respectable. So the next, the negative impact of the U.S. and the China trade conflict, the direct impact, has not been there yet. And then how come there's some kind of deceleration, very observable, especially in the private sectors in China? I think it is because some kind of result induced by 
the supply side structural reform, which Chinese government implemented. As you know, since 2016, Chinese government advocated we need to have some kind of supply side structural reform in order to improve the quality of our economy and to avoid the possible systematic financial risk. And the item in those kind of structural reforms mainly cut down the excess capacity. The excess capacity in the steel, in coal, in aluminum, those kind of investment good sectors. And reducing stock, especially housing stock in the third tier, fourth tier cities. And the third one, very important one, the leveraging especially to reduce high leverage ratio of the steel enterprises. And the fourth item, to reduce the administrative cost, administrative burden to the enterprises. And the last one, to remove the bottlenecks of the growth in the Chinese economy. And so far, the focus has been on the first three items reducing excess capacity, reducing the stocks, and uh, deleveraging. And uh, all those kind of reforms are contractionary, are contractionary. Chinese government should be commended for the willingness to check out those kind of contractionary structural reform. We know that structural reform has been discussed almost in every country. But because most structural reform has been confectionary, so most governments only talk, but Chinese implement. But as a result, for example, if you have a deleverage, we reduce availability of credit. And certainly, it will cause the credit cost to rise, increase the investment cost. And when you try to reduce the capacity, cut down the capacity in steel, in coal, and so on, you reduce supply, push up the prices of the steel, almost triple. Push up the prices of coal, almost triple. And then increase the operational cost for the downstream industries. And most downstream industries are in the private sector. So as a result, the private sectors has been squeezed from the both side. On the one hand, the credit availability, availability reduced, cost of credit increased, but at the same time, the profitability of private sectors declined, and uh, it turned into some kind of vicious cycles. The bank would not give loan to the firm which profit has been declining. And so that is the reason that the private sector feel a lot hurt in the past year and reduce their investment. That's one thing, causing the slowing down in the investment and the slowing down in the growth. And the second one also, also you know, is a result of policy. Because in the past 40 years, the growth in China has been very impressive by environmental degradation is also quite real. And the Chinese government want to reverse that. And so Chinese government implement a very rigorous environmental regulation. And uh, so there are some kind of environmental inspection. As a result, many firms, if their environmental standards you know, do not meet the regulation, they are closing down. And uh, that also you know, affect many small and uh, medium-sized firms, and especially small and medium-sized firms in the private sectors. And that's another reason why the economic growth rate you know, last year decelerated. And the third one, I mentioned the US-China trade relation. So far, if you look into the trade statistics, we haven't seen that the negative impact but psychologically, people feel uncertain about the future. 
If they feel uncertain about the future, certainly they will refrain from making too much investment. And again, that is also another reason why the economic growth rate in last year is slowing down. So looking ahead, what will be the prospect for China's growth in 2019? And for this, I'm confident China will be able to maintain a growth rate around 6.5%, around, not up or down, but around 6.5%. My main reason is that Chinese government policy certainly is responsive, contingent. And I mentioned that the supply side structural reform has five items. In the past years, the focus was on the first three items, which were contraction. And uh, because it has been implemented, excess capacity has been cut down. There's no need to further cut excess capacities. And uh, the stocking has been completed. And uh, to reduce the leverage of steel and prices, the leverage of steel and prices has been dropped. There's no need to further implement that. And the Chinese government also she in the slowing down of the Chinese economy. And now the focus will be shift to the item force and item fix. And both two items are expansion. To reduce the administrative cost or hurdles. So the Chinese government cut down the tax for the private sectors. And it just, you know, a few days ago, announced new tax code. For the small enterprises, if their annual revenue is less than 1 million yuan, the corporate income tax will be due down to 5%. If their annual revenue is between 1 million to 3 million, their tax rate will be 10%. That is a very substantial in corporate income tax cut. Certainly, that will stimulate the investment. And also to reduce the business red tax. You know, there is a measurement about how good the business environment, that is the World Bank doing business indicators. And the Chinese government did a lot to improve that. So the new, the new ranking, China's ranking improved from 78 last year up to now 46 this year. And certainly that will be creating a favorable environment for the business community. And China also will you know, expand the pilot in a free trade zone uh, 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 experiment. And uh, to expand and to implement the negative list, that means there will be more opportunity for the foreign firm to make investment in China, and Chinese government will encourage that. So that's also expansion. Not only so, the last item, to remove the bottlenecks of Chinese economy. And there are many bottlenecks in the Chinese economy. One thing is that in the industrial sectors, currently most industries in China are in the low, medium, value-added sectors. China has bottleneck in higher value added sectors. So China will support investment in industrial upgrading. That's expansionary. And infrastructure. China can further improve the infrastructure. And especially the inner city, you know, public service related infrastructure. China also needs to improve the environment. And uh, so go green, that requires investment. And uh, China is also on the process of urbanization, because urbanization rate in China today is only about 59% of the population. To be a high income country in general, urbanization rate, urbanization rate is about 80% or more. So China is still on the process of urbanization, and that will require investment, and that's expansion. And uh, well, you have opportunity for good investment, and you also need to have fund for making investment. And uh, for this, China is also in a good position 
because the government that accumulated here as a percentage of GDP officially, 58%, unofficially by some estimation by the by some you know think tank, 68%. No matter 58% or 68%, that means combined central government and local government, and including the investment vehicles. It's very long. So there's some scope for further expansion and fiscal stimulus to support, let's say, infrastructure investment, environmental investment, and uh, urbanization related public investment. And uh, also, not only in the fiscal policy, China can also you know, relax a little bit of the monetary policy because currently the reserve requirement for big banks in China is 14%. And uh, for the small bank in China, it's 12%. But we know that larger requirement is only 8%. So if necessary, Chinese government can reduce the reserve ratio and release the credit of ability to, to the private sectors. Plus, China has a very high savings, around 45% of China GDP. So as long as there are good investment opportunity and the government uses its fiscal stimulus to leverage private sector investment, I think the private sector investment will bounce back. And across Chinese government certainly also emphasize the importance of the private sectors. Now Xi Jinping made four speeches last year to say private sectors is a pillar for China's economic development. So for that, I think that investment from the private sectors as well as the public sector will be increased this year. By that, I think that as long as China, you know, max reasonable, you know, rate of increase in investment, job will be created, household income will continue to grow, consumption will be maintained. So, by that, I think that the growth in China should be able to reach, you know, as I said, 6.5 percent around, and that depends on certainly the U.S. trade China relations. And hopefully, because the recent conclusion, other negotiation can come to a stop for this trade conflict. And that will be a positive to the growth in China also. So if China grow at the rate I predict, currently China's economic size is about 16% of global GDP. If China maintain around 6.5% growth, China will contribute about one percentage point to the global growth. According to the World Bank, 2019, the global growth will be around 2.93%. So that means what? China will continue to contribute about 30% of the growth to the global economy. The Chinese market, Chinese you know, growth will be an opportunity for the Chinese people, but it will be an opportunity for the business community in the world, including the business community in the U.S. And I hope you know, the result of the trade conflict will, you know, for city case, U.S. business community to take a larger share of China's growth. Thank you very much. <laughs>